Grüezi miteinander. That means hello in Swiss. Um, everyone can hear me okay? Good. Um, so, let's get to the first slide. Hello again. Um, I've been speaking quite loudly and in all the parties this week, so I hope my voice holds out. But anyway, my name is Graham Pugh. I currently work in Switzerland at ETH Zurich as a senior Apple client engineer. These are my social thingies. Uh, at the bottom there is uh, my blog. I've just posted a link about half an hour ago to everything that's in this talk today. So any links and any commands are already there for you to look at. And I'll also post that at the end as a reminder. So I'm happy to talk today about AutoPackage and Jamf Pro. Um, I'm not sure I'll be able to see you very well, but can I ask how many of you are already using AutoPackage? OK, good. About half, I guess. Um, so how many of you are manually creating and importing packages uh, using Composer or whatever, and then Jamf Admin to get them into Jamf? Quite a lot of well. How, lot, how many of you would rather not do that? <laughs> good, good. So I'm going to try and cover everything from total beginner to some more advanced workflows. Um, so we'll look at setting everything up and running existing auto package recipes. And then we'll look inside recipes to help you understand what they do and show how you can or what you can customize. And then some more advanced use cases or different use cases where you might need to create your own recipes. And finally, um, we'll wrap up with a look at the future of JSS Importer and take some questions, hopefully, this time. First, just a little bit about me and where I work and how that led to my involvement with JSS Importer. I work at ETH Zurich, as I said, which is the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. And uh, it's one of the world's top universities. It's the top in continental Europe. Like Switzerland itself, ETH has a very federal mindset, the high degree of autonomy for professors and their institutes and they employ their own IT teams. So the central IT services is a, is a reasonable sized group, and they are a service provider to those teams. So as those teams are distributed and independent of each other, the Apple services team of Mark Schlapfer, Kat uh, and myself with team leader Thomas Richter provide individual Jamf Pro instances to each customer, just like an MSP, really. Um, so we're currently maintaining 31 on-premises Jamf Pro instances for our customers, and we've trained around 120 administrators on how to use their individual instance. And our core uh, job really is to um, provide over software titles to those Jamf Pro instances to our customers, and we have over 100. And that's not just the packages that we provide, it's also the policies, smart groups, and so on. And our customers want to choose how to deploy that software. So we provide different policies for self-service or automatic install, automatic update, and uninstallers, and so on. And we really couldn't provide that level and variation of services that we do without a high degree of automation. So to handle the volume of packages that we generate and offer for deployment, auto package is essential to us. And we didn't want to provide a sort of hybrid system of Jamf plus another um, product because we give our administrators access to their Jamf Pro instances and we didn't want to give them a second interface. So we're trying to do everything within Jamf. Um, and under these circumstances, JSS Importer is really the only well-established way to integrate Jamf with Auto Package. So that's why I've got so heavily involved in this. So let's dive in and look at uh, how we set it up, what they are, and how they work. So let's start with an analogy. Um, as I'm British, I like to make meat pies. And when I go to a meat pie recipe, the first thing it does is refer me to another recipe for making the pastry. Now I live in Switzerland, I might make Chesechwechli instead. Uh, yeah, it's a kind of a cheese pie. Um, but the first part of this recipe is the same. There's two parts to this workflow, and 
there can be variations on the second part. The so auto package actually follows this same concept. If you want to get an application into Jamf Pro's repo, you're first going to need to obtain a package, which you might need to build from a source DMG or zip file. And that same package could be used if you're uploading to some, some other system like Monkey. It's just a different repository, really. And then there's an additional step here. To get that source file, you need information on where to find it on the web or whatever. So AutoPackage uses different files containing instructions for each part of this workflow. And these files are called recipes. The JSS, or monkey recipes, tell AutoPackage how to upload the package to their respective repositories. Each recipe also contains a reference identifier to the package recipe. That's referred to as the parent. This package recipe contains instructions to create a deployable package from downloaded source material, and it contains a reference identifier to the download recipe. And when you run a JSS recipe, it works through the parents in turn, so it complete the whole workflow. <laughs> Dogs outside, that's fun. <laughs> um, so to interpret auto package recipes, you obviously need to install some software. You need to install auto package. It's just a package installer from GitHub, the address here. Um, auto package uses Git, and so you need to install Git somehow. Uh, an easy way is with the Xcode command line tools. There are others. Um, JSS importer is not bundled in with auto package. So next, you need to install that, and it's also just a package installer on GitHub. Then you need to configure JSS Importer, because you need to give it access to Jamf Pro and tell it how to connect. And you will need to uh, make a user on your Jamf Pro server, which has the necessary rights to interact with the Jamf Pro API. Don't use your main administrator account. That, would, that gives it too much power. You don't need to do that. The wiki of JSS Importer tells you what setup you need to do. I also have a script which can do all that setup in one go called Auto Package Setup for JSS, so go check that out. Links are all in that blog post, so I won't hang about too long. Um, so once you have Auto Package installed and JSS Importer installed and configured, we can start to obtain and run recipes. Lots of people in the Mac admin community share recipes in GitHub repositories. Sorry, that's probably very white. <laughs> um, but if there's anyone in here, thanks very much. It's an amazing job that everyone is doing. Um, and most of these repos are gathered into a single organization on GitHub, which means that Auto Package knows where to look to find recipes of individual software. Auto Package itself is an easy to use command line tool. And we're just going to quickly go through the commands that you would commonly need to use to get your job done. Um, first of all, to search for a recipe, it's the search verb. Here I'm searching for item 2. I get a list of possible recipes. I want a Jamf one. They're called .jss. And we, there we go. There is one. And uh, it's in a repo called JSS Recipes. To use this recipe, I need to download that repo to my computer. And it's actually a Git clone operation. So it tells you in the instructions here, we use auto package repo add. It Git clones it to your computer, and you get a search path. Or it adds it to the search path, which is where auto package looks for recipes. We also need to make sure we have the parent recipes locally on our computer. You can use the info command for this. Um, if it doesn't find it, it offers you to search for it in GitHub again. So in this case, it tells you there's no, there's no recipe for this identifier here. So it searches for that identifier. There's the package one. We need to add the HU to line in recipes. Let's do that. You can see it's been added to the end of the search path. Run info again, because we might need to find the download recipe. But actually, no, we get a good description now. That means we've got all the recipes we need to run the whole workflow from download packaging JSS. And you can see here that you see the paths to each file on your computer. 
And what you need to do now is go and look at these files and make sure you understand what they're doing and that you trust them. Auto package is really powerful. It's building packages that you could have no idea about, and you're distributing them potentially to all your clients. So that's obviously uh, dangerous, powerful, and you need to make sure that you trust those packages to protect your users. Fortunately, Auto Package has a built-in safety feature to make sure you do go check those files. It is not set by default, but I really recommend that you do that. And it's just this default write command to the Auto Package preferences. I would recommend that. To actually run a recipe, Auto Package run, and then the name of the recipe. I've just run it, but I haven't given it any, I haven't told Auto Package that I trust it yet. So it fails, it says there's no trust information present. That's your cue to go and verify that these files are OK. Once, you've, you know, once you're happy with them, you do this thing, make override. It's making an override file. And an override file is actually another recipe. It's a special recipe that has the main JSS recipe, in this case, as its parent. And inside this recipe, it has trust information about each of the parent recipes that, that are in that chain. It's basically the hash of each file. Now we've made that override. We run this again. It's running the override this time. It has the same name. It's happy with the trust information, so it, it goes ahead. You can see here that it's downloaded an item. It's a zip file. It built a package, gave you the version information, and um, like a bunch of changes, I should do it this way, a bunch of changes were made to um, the J your Jamf Pro server. Like it's uh, new categories, a group, the policy object, and icon, and so on. If we run the recipe again, and the source files haven't changed, nothing happens. It, it's, it makes a check that there's nothing new to download. Sometimes it has to download it and then check it's different. Uh, but if it's not, it stops there, which means you can safely run these recipes on a, on a schedule without sort of overloading your computer. Only things that are changed will cause the process to run to completion. So you can run it every night. That's what we do. It also means you can run all your recipes at once using a recipe list file. So rather than run a command for every single one, you just create a recipe list literally just a text file of all the recipes you want to run, and it will just work through them all in turn. Recipes get updated over time. For instance, because the source URL has changed of what you're downloading or something like this. So you need to synchronize your local repositories with what's in GitHub every now and again. This repo update all command will just do them all at once. You can see. It goes through them all and tells you what it's trying to do, if it's up to date or not. We see here, conveniently, that our item 2 JSS recipe has changed. So if we run that recipe again now, it's failing the trust verification uh, because it says the contents differ from expected. At this point, you want to go and look at that recipe again and see what's changed, because you need to trust it again. It's not easy to remember what was in there before compared to what's now, but we have this verb verify trust info, and uh, especially if you use it in, with more verbosity with dash vv, what we get here is a git diff of the file contents. So this, it's even color coded, so you can see what was there before and what's changed, what's new, red and green. And uh, hopefully, yeah, that comes out in this. Uh, in this example, it's just the self-service description has changed. That's innocuous, so we can let this go. Happy to, happy to let that run. What you need to do then, when you're happy, is run update trust info, the verb that, and this will update the hash values in your recipe override so that it's, it's ready to run again. So now I've gone through all those commands. Um, you can actually use a great Mac application uh, and that sort of makes it more convenient um, 
works on top of AutoPackage called AutoPackager. This can be used to do everything from installing and configuring Git, AutoPackage, and JSS Importer, performing all the commands I've been describing in the GUI, and sending notifications to Slack, email, and so on. The app was dormant for a while, but Sean Honsberger, who's here today, um, has, at, works at Linda Group, has now updated it for Catalina, and it's working with the latest JSS importer again, which is great. So a huge thank you to Sean for bringing AutoPackager back to life. It is important to understand that AutoPackager is a wrapper on top of AutoPackage. So when you do something in the GUI, it's just running the commands. So even if you use AutoPackager, I really urge you to understand the, or know the AutoPackage commands and run them in verbose mode for troubleshooting problems. For example, if we run the run command with dash V to get more verbosity, you see lots more information. It shows you what each process in the, in the workflow is doing. You can add up to four Vs here to get like extremely detailed output. To find out more about AutoPackage, the help verb is extremely useful. It gives you a complete set of options. And you can use help, dash dash help, on any of those verbs and get full information about them. The wiki is also essential reading. It's, it's really important that you understand AutoPackage because it is very powerful, as I said. So that was how to use AutoPackage and run recipes. Let's look inside the standard JSS recipes to try and understand what's going on underneath the hood and uh, see what we can customize as well. <laughs> um, so JSS recipes are designed to import packages and create testing policies. If we look at a Jamf Pro server where a few of the standard JSS recipes have run, you can see uh, each recipe is providing consistent content in your server. You get a self-service policy that's in the testing category. It has ongoing frequency. The package is attached. It updates the inventory. And there is a smart group attached to each policy with a consistent naming convention. We'll look at that later. So how that's generated, this is, uh, no, this is a standard JSS recipe. <laughs> it's for Atom. And it's a plist file. They're not the nicest things to look at, but I'm just going to zoom in on various bits to try and break it down and make you understand. So we see here the description and the recipe identifier, as we saw in the info command earlier. Further down, there's the identifier of the parent recipe. Underneath, We've got all the arguments for the JSS importer processor itself. So there's keys here for package and policy categories, smart group and policy templates, self-service description, and so on. But each key here has a variable name inside percentage signs, rather than the hard-coded value. These are overridable variables, and you'll see them in all, all the types of auto-package recipe. At the top of the recipe, is an input dictionary. Uh, and this is where the default values for all those variables are, are set. If you want to change any of these overridable values to customize uh, how, it, how it ends up in your Jamf Pro server, you don't edit the JSS recipe itself. You instead go to the recipe override file that we made earlier. So let's go and look inside there. This is the override file for Atom, again, you can see here the same input keys that were in the JSS recipe itself. They've been copied in when the recipe override was created. And so you can now edit any of these locally. That stays local on your computer and doesn't interfere with the repository itself. Um, and one thing about that is like when you update the trust info, if, if the, uh, the GitHub repo has changed, uh, it doesn't overwrite this section. It only injects the new hash values, which are off the bottom of here, parent recipe trust information. You just have to make sure you leave that bit alone, only edit inside the input dictionary. Notice in here, there are 
three keys here that are actually referring to files, separate files, template files. JSS recipes use these XML template files to create policy objects and smart groups. Like recipes, these files contain variables that can be overridden in the recipe overrides. That means that they can be reused for multiple recipes. In fact, you can use the same single policy template and smart group template for most of your recipes. You don't need one for every, a separate one for every single recipe. Some recipes, however, need some more templates for extension attributes or scripts, maybe because the scoping is more complex, or you need a post-install script to complete the deployment or something. Um, then you need your own template, you need additional templates for that. If in an existing recipe, if, the, if that's the case, these should be provided in the same folder as the recipe itself by whoever made the repository. And you also should have an icon file because we're creating self-service uh, policies here. That should also be in the repo. So this is the standard smart group, uh, this time for iterm2. This is what's generated by the, the template that's provided. You see here it's a computer. Ooh, hang on. Back too soon. Um, the criterion now is that uh, a computer has an application of a particular name. The application version is not the one that this recipe or this policy is providing, and that the computer group is a member of the testing group. How this was designed, all this recipe design for JSS, was that it's for testing. So this is a group that you create. Normally, it's a static group. It doesn't have to be. but. So let's see how that compares to the template. This is the smart group template that created that smart group. And yeah, it's, it's kind of very similar. You see the three criteria. Application title is as a variable for the JSF inventory name, which is uh, the application name. Application version is not version. And computer group is testing. There's not much you can override here, because that JSS inventory name and version, those variables are actually generated automatically during the auto-package process. And uh, the testing group is hard-coded in. So you can't override that. You can only override variables. If you do want to change this, that means you have to edit this template file yourself. Uh, you could add criteria or change them. It just means you can't just override a value. You have to actually edit this file or create a separate file. If you do that, you should store this file in your recipe overrides directory. Uh, and just a note, if you do make your own group templates or changing them, uh, you'll see there's keys for and or. And there's keys for opening parentheses and closing parentheses. So just like if you're in the GUI. So you can do the full, the full set of things. And one important thing is you have to get these priority keys right from zero up. If you get this wrong, it just doesn't interpret it properly. And you can end up with an empty smart group zero criteria, which is bad news in Jamf. That means all computers. So we don't want that. So this is the standard policy template. So let's see what we can override in here. First of all, notice that the scope, the package configuration, and the scripts are automatically handled during the JSS importer process. So you don't uh, generally um, edit these directly in the template. That's all being handled by the variables in the, in the override file. Um, a couple things to note by this standard policy template that is provided in, in the, the JSS recipes repo. The name of the policy is not completely overridable. It's been hard coded with the words install latest. Same thing with the install button text. So if you want to change these values in a more fundamental way than that, you're going to have to edit this policy template directly. So 
again, like the smart group. If you do that, then you should make a copy of this, put it in your recipe overrides directory, and that will take precedence over the sort of standard one. As an example, this is the one that we use at ETH. It's not much different. The only thing that I've changed is the, the, the name. We put the version in the name, and we don't put it in the install button text. So we had to change our template to do that. And um, yeah. Here's another example which is a bit more different. Um, this is a trigger-only policy that you could generate instead of a self-service policy. Um, the things we change here is that you do actually, in this case, change the scope to all computers, because if it's something you're just pulling with an event trigger, um, then you're going to determine how that runs from some, something else, like another policy, an enrollment or enrollment policy or something. And uh, you add a key here for trigger other, which is the, the trigger name, and you can supply that value in your recipe override. So that's a look at the standard recipes that are out there in GitHub, the extent to which you can customize them by overriding values or templates. If your needs are not met by these standards, you can still use JSS Importer, but you may have to create your own recipes. If there are existing download and package recipes for your app, you only need to create the JSS recipe. And if that exists, but it's just not the right configuration for you, then you can just copy it into your own repo, make the edits you need, and uh, you sh it shouldn't, maybe isn't a lot of work to do. You just have to make sure you give it a different identifier than the standard, so that auto package doesn't get confused which one to run. If there's no JSS recipe yet for an app, you can use a tool called JSS Recipe Creator to easily make one. This was created by Shay Craig, who uh, I should have already mentioned is the guy who wrote JSS Importer. And um, you run this from the command line with an auto option, specify a path to the parent package recipe. It'll just ask you what package category you want, and then automatically generate the recipe for you. You can just put it in your own repository or in a local folder, and it's good to go. Something a bit more off-piece that I'm getting a lot of questions about recently is um, using auto-package to import packages, but not create these policies and smart groups. Um, to do this, you need to currently create your own recipes. They're just a little bit too different to override. Um, a use case for this I've seen in another session this week is um, if you're integrating auto-package with patch management, for instance, you just want the package. You don't want any policies that you're not going to use. Um, Daz Wallace of DataJar has a blog post on this uh, link here and also in my blog about um, creating these package-only recipes. And his suggestion was that rather than use the .jss suffix, uh, we use .jss-upload to avoid confusion, especially if we start to share these a bit more. Here's an example, package-only recipe, this time for an app called Unison. Since we don't want a policy or a group, the only thing the recipe needs is a name and a category for the package. There's nothing else. There's not all those keys that were in our standard recipe don't need to exist. And the input array, array is also, therefore, very simple, just those two values. And because there is not really any external cri additional criteria other than the package, nearly all package-only recipes look the same as this. So they're easy to create. Since there's been a recent interest in this, um, I've added the abil ability to make these in the JSS recipe creator. So you just, from the command line, we'll just use the package-only flag. It'll again just ask you to press specify the, uh, well, you, you, you specify the parent, same as before. It'll just ask you for the category of the package and automatically generate that recipe. So you could probably get all of your apps done in half an hour or something. 
So what about using recipes to create your production policies? The, the original um, design of this was only for testing, and the idea was you make your production policies manually and just go and change the package for the new version when you're ready to, to promote. But you might have heard of uh, Elliot Jordan's update, auto-update magic. He actually presented it here five years ago, and it's still, still relevant now. It's a complete testing to production workflow, which is using the standard JSS recipes for testing and a different set of recipes for prod that you need to create. These, you run these manually at the, when you've gone through your uh, testing process you're ready to promote. He provides some examples, um, but you generally need to make your own. So in our environment, we also have a bunch of policies in our Jamf Pro server that don't have packages at all. We've got script-based policies for all sorts of things, like uninstallers, uh, or installing printers, or ignoring updates, all sorts of things. You can also use JSS Importer for this, because it can be used to create any type of policy. A script-only script recipe is just like a standard recipe, but it doesn't need a parent, because there's no package to source. You'll just have the script itself in the same folder as, as your recipe. You have to explicitly specify that there is no package path, just telling JSS Importer not to look for one. And then you need an array, a script array like this, which uh, is just the, the name of the script, actually the path to the script. Um, and you also need a template for each script, which is where the additional information about that script, like whether it's a before or after priority or things like that, is provided, so that's another type of XML template. Again, these, are, these can be overridable values, so you can create sort of single, single templates for things. Oh, I think, uh, hang on, I had another note there. Um, oh yeah, just that depending on the purpose of the script, you might want to make it once per computer policy, or you might scope based on an extension attribute or something like this. Uh, you can put those in with your recipe as well. And yeah, so this, I mean, kind of means you can um, version control and automate everything, every type of policy in your Jamf Pro server using JSS Importer and Auto Package. It's pretty good. I've got some examples of script only policies in my Graham Pew recipes repo uh, to get you started. But I intend to get all our uninstaller policies in there. I've had them all private for now, but like, I think most of them, there's no reason for them to be private, so I'm going to start to publish those. And now I have to do that again. OK, so finally, let's take a look at the future of JSS Importer. Um, as I said, Shay Craig wrote it, but he's no longer involved. He's not a Jamf customer anymore. It's a huge kudos for him for making this amazing thing. Um, but so now it's sort of dependent on three big factors, I think. Um, the first one is Apple and their relationship with Python. Um, Apple have bundled Python 2 in with Mac OS since the early days of OS X. And JSS Importer is a Python-based processor. So it's also dependent on an underlying Python framework that Che wrote called Python JSS. But the Python developers have declared that January 2020 is the end of life date for Python 2. And Apple responded by saying that in a future version of Mac OS, whatever this means, um, they just won't include Python at all. So Nick McSpadden at Facebook and others are currently refactoring Auto Package to work on Python 3. There's a beta version out now. but um, Myself or somebody also has to do the same thing with Python JSS and, J and JSS Importer. Um, the mysterious Mosin has actually done some of that work already, but there's definitely busy times ahead for the few months, next few months. Second thing we depend on is, of course, Jamf. Back in 2014, when JSS Importer was created, there was no Jamf cloud, as far as I know. Um, Packages were uploaded to your repo, your local repo, SMB, AFP, or something. But when the JDS, Jamf Distribution Server, was created, 
They did not create an official API object for uploading packages. Uh, Shay Craig was able to reverse engineer Casper Admin, the app, to figure out how, what it was doing to upload it to the, the JDS. And he found as an undocumented API request object for doing this. So he built that into Python JSS so that JSS Importer would work with that. But it's, yeah, it's, it's always been a bit of a hack. And unfortunately, Jamf Cloud also has, not to date, no official documented API object either. And um, we're lucky that that method for JDS still works for this. But it's quite fragile. Um, I've actually had some good discussions with Jamf this week, really good, about this problem. And um, I'm confident that it's being worked on. But you can help by upvoting this feature request. This planned is a little deceptive. Or, well, hopefully, after the, my discussions this week, it's, it's good. But uh, that's been there for two years. So please, upvote. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then another problem we have is uh, with the migration to Jamf Cloud for more and more people is the API performance. Um, the way JSS Importer works is to send a series of separate API requests to uh, join this recipe run to make all the required changes, like uploading the package itself, creating a package object, creating any new categories, creating any linked scripts or extension attributes, creating the smart group or groups, uploading or creating the policy itself, and the icon. And many of these API requests depend on each other. For example, if you try and create a policy um, and specify a category that doesn't exist yet, it will just fail. The problem here that we have is that Jamf Cloud is clustered. And, but there's no method for the API to hit the same node for each request. So we get false conflicts and errors sometimes when we make a request, because it might be hitting the wrong node before everything's synchronized between all of the nodes. And I've been trying to add wait loops and checks and things into JSS Importer with some success, but definitely not completely. Um, but yeah, I've also had some really good discussions this week about this. Over the last couple of days, so I, I, th I think we might be onto something on how we can solve this. So, however, you can also help here by upvoting this uh, feature request um, that's not had as much love as the other one. Uh, but yeah, please do. And the third thing that JSS Importer's future depends on is is you. Um, it's an open source project. It's widely used, but the original developer is no longer involved. And at the moment, as you've seen, there's quite a lot to do to keep it alive. Um, I'm just one guy trying to help, but uh, yeah. Uh, so whether you work at Jamf or you're a Jamf customer who's a keen Python scripter, wants to get their teeth into something, or are just happy to help test JSS Importer in your environment, we'd be, or I'd be very happy to work with you. With that, thank you very much for listening. As I said at the start, it's an essential part of our Apple device management service at ETH Zurich. And I hope it can help you out too if you're not already using it. Just to reiterate, provided the links to everything I've described in this presentation in my blog about 1 o'clock. Um, there's a few extra things I didn't have time to talk about in there. Uh, we also have auto package JSS importer, JSS rec recipe creator, and some other related tools directly in the Jamf marketplace. So go check that out too. And with that, thank you very much. <laughs> and it's time for questions. I made it. Hi. Hey, a real quick one that you may have mentioned that I missed it. 
When you have a policy, I mean a uh, recipe that uploads directly into a policy and you don't have the name change for the version number, does it replace the previous package that was there? So it's kind of like a auto updating policy that always has the latest version of that package? The testing policy you mean? Yes. Or, yeah, it'll just, um, it, it sort of overrides an existing, uh, if there's already a policy there, it will just override the values that have changed. Okay, so yeah. the uh, packages that were there before will be <laughs> replaced with the new packages? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so you don't need to delete the policy to make the new one start or something. It will just overwrite them. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, okay. Hey, Hi. thanks for the talk. Uh, so do you know of any plans or anything like that with maybe future JSM importer stuff to integrate adding the package automatically to patch management? Or is there even any API commands to allow that? The API exists. Um, and yeah, some people have worked on it, actually. I know there's a guy in Switzerland called Seb Tomasi who has a post-processor to do this. Oh, it, okay. You don't really need to integrate it into JSS Importer because you can, um, you can run auto-package with a, like a post-processor like as an extra key, yeah. and, and that can just do additional things afterwards. So it will use the values that JSS Importer um, created or obtained or in the recipe, and then it can do extra things. Okay. And I'm not using patch, but I am using it for all sorts of, I use these post processes for things like copying to all our different instances and things. So I think that's, that's probably the way to do it. And I'm, I, I think I'll be trying to look at this next year for sure. Okay. What was the person's name again that you said? Seb Tomasi. Okay. Thank um, you. He has a different Slack handle, but that's his GitHub awesome. uh, address. Thank so, you so much. Okay. Hi. Um, this doesn't do anything with stripping out any of the notarization or signing of the packages when you, you upload it via the recipe, everything there stays intact? It does not. Like, you don't need to sign and notarize packages for distribution by Jamf. Um, so auto package does not build that in. Um, you could, there's no reason why you couldn't uh, have a process that did the signing. I think the notarization would be more difficult. Um, because you have, to, you have to submit to Apple and wait for it to come back. And Apple have also said that you should not be notarizing apps that you didn't create yourself in your organization. So if, like, this, that would be a, maybe a method if it worked for in-house apps, and like if you're bundling up scripts and things yourself. Um, but I, I wouldn't recommend it for you know, just notarizing a, a Firefox package or something like this. OK, thanks. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much.